Our scripture text this morning <clears throat> comes from the letter to the Hebrews, selected verses from chapter 1 and chapter 2. The author writes, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, he created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name of God gave him, the name God gave him is greater than their names. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place the scriptures say, What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Or a son of man that you should care for him? Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What we do see is Jesus, who, gave, who was given a position a little lower than the angels, and because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. So now, Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. May God bless to us this reading from his holy word. Do you ever wonder if anyone or anything really runs this whole world now? This whole show? As you peer into your own life, does some inexplicable event, some confounding tragedy or protracted illness get you down, eat you up? Has your hope that finally someone is really in charge of this creation, preparing to carry everything ultimately to a gracious and peaceful end, suggested just a lot of wishful thinking? And as you look at the history of the Christian church and see the church and the world in a variety of mortal conflicts and perceive creature types as frequently indulging in sentimental drivel. Does your faith wobble? Does your hope shrivel a little? If so, you are in very good company. Because you see, the letter to the Hebrews is written to an exhausted, discouraged cynical congregation. We don't know where they are located, exactly. We don't know who writes to them, but we do know they stumble along on their last legs. They've got tired blood. They're losing members by the ton. For many of them, the Christian faith has turned out to be, at best, a wild superstition. At worst, a vile hoax. They're giving up. 
they're drifting away. They're trying something else. And then, this letter. Do you know what this letter writer says to this discouraged and strained congregation? He says, we have a God who talks. In the past, he spoke through the prophets. The prophets who delivered his message in a number of different situations. But a prophet's picture of God was always incomplete. It was flavored with the prophet's own personality and confined to his particular setting. But now God has made himself absolutely clear through his son. Jesus is God's word in person for all time and for every place. The author recommends study of Christ. He doesn't putter around with language for novices and beginners. He doesn't seduce us with subtle programmatic decoys. He doesn't beguile us with cliches. He doesn't, tant doesn't offer tantalizing invitations to religion by the numbers. He tells us what makes Jesus the Christ. He delivers a straightforward testimony, evoking a vital, incisive presence, a presence living with us, a presence with us in death, a presence who suffers and struggles, fails and triumphs, braves and endures with us all the perils we share, a presence bearing in and radiating through a person the very assurance of what we hope for, the essence and conviction of things we cannot see. Jesus was God the Father at the beginning. It was he who was God's agent in creating the universe. Now he has fulfilled all God's purposes. It is Jesus who has shown us what God is like by reflecting God's glory or his worth and revealing his nature. It is Jesus who holds creation together in beautiful order and harmony, preventing it from collapsing into chaos. Now Jesus has completed the task of saving us from sin by offering himself as the perfect and complete sacrifice. His work is done. He has resumed his rightful place in heaven, the throne of highest honor alongside his Father. Do you see how this author, this preacher, for in reality what he writes is more like a sermon than a letter, how this preacher begins his testimony? He asserts, long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he spoke to us by a son. In other words, God spoke to us in fragments, he suggests, he spoke in different fashions, in different styles, in different moods. It might be through someone like Elijah, compelling us to make choices in our loyalties. Or Amos, turning us to social justice. Or Hosea, describing one who bends toward us as a loving husband toward a wayward spouse. But in these last days, says our correspondent, God speaks to us by a son a child, a human being like you, like me, in this person we encounter the ultimate, the final word, sent, spoken, revealed. Through this human being, this fellow pilgrim, we see the consummate presence of the divine life packaged in flesh and blood. Through this son, this divine child, we find ourselves encountered challenged and embraced by the core, the very heart, the mind and soul of the radiant, overflowing grace grounding our lives and all of creation. This is it at last, this culminating, concluding, perfect word, not simply spoken, but now 
incarnate. Hebrews talks about the importance of faith. Following Christ may be hard, but once we've realized who he is, there's no turning back. The only way is forward. Faith means living on earth in the light of heaven. The readers of this letter have had a tough time. They have been ill-treated for their faith. Some have suffered imprisonment and loss of property, and they're just tempted to give up. This letter encourages them to persevere, to set their sights on Jesus as their pioneer. The writer urges his readers not to slip back into their old Jewish ways. The tabernacle, the priests, and the sacrifices were all inadequate and temporary and are now obsolete. What might this incarnate presence mean to us? He exclaims, Jesus, as Christ, is heir of all things. What a confession! Our author answers our perennial question. Where are things headed? What does life mean? Are we just a blob of protoplasm? An itch on the epidermis of a doomed planet? Or more bluntly, does the one who ends up with the most toys or the most weapons win? Do the rich get richer? The violent carry the day? Do the political spinmeisters, PR flags, and Budweiser apologists define the criteria for truth? Perhaps, perhaps for some of us they do. Resisting cynicism can be very difficult. But our preacher, the author of Hebrews, will not surrender to cynicism. To sense the force of this argument, let's draw an imaginary horizontal line. The writer notes that the realm of humanity has been below the line and that of angels above the line. This is despite the fact that God in creating gave humanity his own image, likeness, and dominion. So what God did to fulfill his promise was to send Jesus to live below the line that in dying he might be lifted far above the line, above even the realm of angels, in being lifted up and crowned with glory and honor, he lifted us up too. He affirms that what makes Jesus Christ the heir of all things lies in the truth, in the trust we risk, that through whatever crisis and trouble we now pass, we are joined by one whose love bears the crisis with us. One whose grace lies in binding the loose ends, transfiguring the twisted, reconciling our antagonisms, healing our self-inflicted wounds. This heir of all things becomes our brother, by passing through the stresses, the bruises, the afflictions life throws at him. No different than you or me. When the Eternal One sees one of us walking toward lethal injection, or huddling in garbage bags on warm street ventilators, or an alcoholic crawling under some cardboard boxes, or anyone living with the chronic threat of AIDS, or an Iraqi, Afghan, or American rotting under the Mideastern sun. Through all of this, the Savior does not see a charity case, a pitiful victim, or hopeless cause. This Christ sees a brother. This Christ sees a sister, and is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. 
This Christ, who comes to us in these last days, does not brush aside misery with the wag of a head and a cluck. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Instead, we hear, there, because of the grace of God, I am. We are bound to Christ by our pain and by our faith. Our faith that our side stands, on our side, stands one who bears that pain with us and who guarantees it will not have the last word. We live by that hope, that conviction we do not see. We simply, humbly, gratefully trust. In coming to earth, Jesus has taken on our human nature. He has fought the devil on his own ground and destroyed his power. But it was costly. He felt the full force of temptation and the agony of suffering. He knows what it's like for us. This rendering of the gospel by our author assures us God knows what it's like to be us. The reflection of God's glory we see in Jesus as the Christ comes not through pomp and circumstance, not through crown and gowns, not the trappings and ceremony we assemble to celebrate the place of position honored by office or accomplishment in our civilization. It comes through the anguish, the pain, the bloody defeat and terrible death suffered by this God incarnate in Jesus the Christ on the cross at Calvary. The cross makes Jesus our brother. Can we grasp that? Can we understand that? Jesus Christ, as our preacher affirms, is our friend, our brother, because through his suffering and death, he knows what it's like to be you and me. He experiences the height, the depth, and breadth of our humanity. No less than you or I. Christ is joined. God is joined emphatically, empathetically to the human condition. And so we ask, as we asked at the beginning, do you believe anyone is really running the show? Is there someone in charge? Of course. And we affirm it because long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by the Son heir of all things, creator of the worlds, reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being sustaining all things, all things by his powerful word, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Let us pray. Lord God, we stand on the threshold of eternity. We know that each day belongs to God, as do we. In the name of the triune God, we offer ourselves for service in the realms of health and welfare, justice and peace. Grant that through us, others may see and know you. In the name of our brother, Jesus Christ. Amen.